You are listening to the War on the Rocks podcast on strategy, defense, and foreign affairs. My name is Ryan Evans. I'm the founder of War on the Rocks. And in this episode, I sat down with Skylar Moore and Justin Finelli. Both are chief technology officers in the Defense Department. Skylar's at Central Command. You might remember her from an earlier episode of the pod. And Justin is at the Department of the Navy. I spoke to them about what it's like to be a CTO in DOD. So I'm sitting in a room talking to two CTOs at the Defense Department. And not too long ago, there wouldn't have been chief technology officers in the Defense Department. Skylar, you've been on the show before. For those that didn't listen to your episode, how did you end up in this place? What were you before you were CTO at CENTCOM? So before I got to CENTCOM, I was still at CENTCOM, only at the Navy component. So I was with Task Force 59, an organization that was focused on unmanned and AI systems, and I was their chief strategy officer. I had the good fortune of meeting General Carrilla through that role. He then opened up a chief technology officer role, and I was very fortunate to be picked for that. And how long were you at Task Force 59? Very briefly. I was there for eight months. It was a mobilization, actually, through the reserves. I haven't been in the Navy Reserve for very long, but they pulled me forward just because the overlap with my civilian background and what they were looking for for that position. And how long have you been CTO now? Almost two years. It's been a wild ride. Uh, and Justin, how about you? Mine was a lot of different domains without intending on ending up here and, and maybe not intending on learning as many things as I did, but started at NGA, worked in the intelligence community, did chief engineer for command and control for DOD. And so that got me exposure into more joint type work. I ended up going back to Navy after that and did some joint staff. The domains at, after that point were business IT, infrastructure, had a little five-year jaunt in healthcare, did some time at DARPA, complained about my computer enough that uh, they put me at PEO Digital, still at PEO Digital. What's PEO Digital? Uh, yeah. So uh, Program Executive Office, Digital and Enterprise Services. So this is within acquisition. We sometimes hear about defense acquisition. This is one of those. They used to have program offices. We recently switched over to portfolios. Pretty excited about that. And then that works in conjunction with the Don CIO. And so that's my other hat is the CTO for across Department of Navy, working the kind of strategy and policy side at the CTO role, and then the execution and acquisition side at PEO Digital. If you could talk to your 15-year-old selves and tell that young version of you that you are a CTO for the Navy, would their reaction be, you're super uncool? Or would it be like, all right, that's pretty cool? 15-year-old Skyler would be very confused. The pathway was to be a professional springboard diver, so we've really gotten off track, I think would be the 15-year-old uh, reflection. For me, yeah, that means that my professional sports career also didn't work out. But if the title existed at that time, that sounds like it'd be pretty cool. Probably try and figure out how to get there, and I'd land on a meandering path, which is what ended up happening anyway. Well, two, two you know, already breaking stereotypes to athletic people who ended up working very closely with technology. So what is it like being a CTO in DOD? What are the day-to-day -day issues and problems that you end up working on? I think it's important to note that the CTO role and the various forms that it comes in DOD appears to me to be quite different from how it exists in commercial sector. Because when you look at a chief technology officer in commercial sector, there tends to be a very specific product and capability that you are delivering on a recurring basis and associated technologies. When you look at CTO for any organization in DOD, the types of technologies that you look at range from cloud computing to AI applications to unmanned aerial systems to network infrastructure, hardware, software, everything you can imagine falls under it. So the CTO role sits in this weird space of translation and prioritization that might look a little bit different than how CTO roles look on the outside. I love that answer. So in general, it ends up being pretty much the widest world possible uh, within the government. We have a lot of stakeholders. We have a lot of priorities. And so anything we can do to make the world smaller, that involves representing, that involves curating some problems, and it involves activating people. If we are able to kind of inventory and shake some things free, then we can create funnels and fast forward. And so like some of the most fun work that we do is we spot something that other people hadn't spotted, or we help elevate the platform of some folks who are doing excellent work, but weren't necessarily getting recognition. And then that gets to spread. So spreading those fires or those winds or those lightning bolts is one of the best parts of the job. Yeah, that's I've observed it as an outsider, you know, knowing Sky for years and getting to know you, Justin, is that 
it's really you're the person in charge of how to think about technology and ask the right questions about how to integrate technology. And that's much more important than mastering a certain area of technology. Because as you were just saying, Sky, how could you master? And no one could master all the areas of technology fielded by CENTCOM in your case and the Navy in your case, Justin. As the government gets more digital in general, like it's interesting to see the evolution of these positions. Sky was the first CTO, if I if I have that right. SOCOM had one before us. We were okay. the first geographic. Right. So yep. Yeah, but who's that person, right? I mean, who really cares about SOCOM? <laughs> <laughs> fighting words. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> and SoCon will win fight, that fight if it's a if it's a hand on fight. I got um, two jocks in the room with me. I'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was trained in springboard diving. I'm ready for any fight. <laughs> and then Jane Rath, but I believe was the first CTO for Department of Navy, and so she's at CIO now. But the evolution of these positions, point is, is that like they continue to shape and adapt to the need. Right. So it's about our outcomes. It's not about the position or who's in. I mean, acting in this role and realizing that the tie between acquisition and this job, people didn't know that. We just kind of stepped in because she promoted and, and that's working out awesomely. And so as we kind of like try to break down barriers and be more productive and progressive within government, I think there's interesting opportunities to do different things. I do think it's worth highlighting your point about asking the right questions and that actually being the primary skill set, because it's not just that we don't know every single technology and that it would be impossible to do so. But to Justin's point, you also have to know how to interact with the acquisition community. You also have to know what questions to ask the users to tease out what their real problem is. Sometimes they will say, frequently they will say, I need AI. What's your actual problem? What are you solving for? Maybe AI is the answer, but there is a broader set of problems that you're really trying to scratch at and figuring out what technologies exist and what communities can get those technologies to them just requires a very rigorous game of question asking that to me is the make or break as to whether or not we're successful. To this point, this came to me from a dear friend who was a partner at a law firm and then went to National Security Council, first time in the government and said, oh, the superpower in the government is framing because there's a world of context and everyone you talk to is only thinking about their set of problems. And so if you can context switch and frame appropriately, you can actually get somewhere. Otherwise you can waste whole meetings. And so the idea of framing in our context switching roles and aligning different communities and different issues, that is a power laws type thing. Like we're not making meetings 10% better if we do that well, we're making them 10 times more productive. I totally agree with that. You report directly to the combatant commander. Who do you report to, Justin, in the Navy? Within PEO Digital, our awesome PEO is retiring at the end of this month. And so we're going to have an acting PEO in there soon. And that's someone who I work on the staff of and with. And then Jane Rathbun as the CIO is where I'm under with the CTO piece. And then my boss, my supervisor is someone in Charleston because of matrix things. And both, from what I understand, at least both of you, no matter where you sit in your respective organizations, a pretty shocking range of people in your respective organizations will reach out to you, will work with you, will come to you with problems. Is that right? Could you talk to that about the range of people you end up working with up, down, throughout, along the chain? I mean, in many ways, I wonder if my user base is a little bit more consistent than Justin's because at the end of the day, we're all working on common operations. So when you look at CENTCOM and our focus in the Middle East, you will at least be centering around common themes. So you'll have our joint directorates that cover personnel, logistics, operations, intelligence, but they're all circling around common problem sets of countering one-way UAS attacks against forces, whether it's mitigating the risks that the Houthis pose in the Red Sea. There are problem sets that we consolidate around that make it a little bit easier, at least to create like hubs for ourselves to focus our efforts rather than being scattered to the winds. And I think Sky is right. That's one of the coolest parts of what we're doing is any number of different communities will hit us up and they'll say, hey, here's the problem I have, I think intersects with something that you're doing or something that we've seen from you. And so there's so much if we do it right, pay off at those intersections. Like intersection living is a really fruitful place. And so sometimes it's just connecting two groups who had similar problems but didn't realize it. And that could be on the basis of technology. It could be on the basis of doctrine. It could be on the basis of, hey, the Marine Corps has this problem and a different part of the Navy have this problem. And the Department of Navy, we're looking at that and we're saying, oh, it looks like these two are a little bit more similar than we thought. 
And so one of the things that we've done to try and make that world a little bit smaller is we've created some design concepts to say, we think that there are more problems in common than there are unique. There are plenty of unique things, but where we can uh, frame you out- better hope, sir. You won't be able to scale solutions. Exactly, exactly. We need to be simple to scale. We have tried to go from complicated to complex to simple. And so some things will just stay in complex, but for the things that are simple, so I'll give you an example. There are a lot of different groups doing piloting. Some called it prototyping, but for nomenclature's sake, like these are all groups doing piloting. A lot of them were overlapping. And sometimes they were learning something. Sometimes they were learning a different thing. Sometimes they were doing almost the exact same thing. And so we just recently came up with a structured piloting, what we called Agile Design Concept. So Agile Center Design Concepts or ACDCs are a instruction, a reference on if you want to do piloting and you don't want to be good at figuring out what a pilot is, but you want to just run it and get the results from that, then use this. And so we put that up and we got... 500 emails within a week of, hey, can we use this? Or occasionally people will just say like, hey, we're on second base now. Like that stuff's happening. And it's it's putting a little bit more attention on the interesting parts and less attention on the common parts. One of the interesting things about having you two here is on my left, I have someone at a force generating organization. On my right, I have someone at a force employment organization. For a lot of our listeners will understand what that means, but the way the Defense Department, the military is organized as you have the force generators, so the services and the departments, Department of the Navy and the U.S. Navy, and then you have the force employers, the geographic combatant commands especially, and Sky's at one and Justin's at the other. So how do you guys end up working together as CTOs from a force generator and a, a force employer? Resolving interface problems most recently. <laughs> do, you want, do you want to take that one? I've been, uh, I've been, I hope gently flame roasting Justin into <laughs> solving a problem for us recently. I think that it may accurately reflect how interaction goes, which is that there are near term problems and long term mechanisms that may result from those problems and how we resolve them that describes the interface from where we are. So, for example, there is a Navy system that we rely on heavily. When that system goes down, we don't have access to critical information. For for us, we were working on getting that system back up and running. Uh, we were moving slowly. The demand signal from a combatant command, as you can imagine, that is not a nice to have, that is a need to have, and it is not a nice to have 12 months from now, it is a need to have right now. So expressing that demand signal and the time sensitivity relative is the space where I can then reach across to Justin and say, this is really important to us and your service owns this. Your service owns the maintenance and upkeep of this system. This is the impact that it has. I think the responsibility that we have as a combatant command is to A, express demand signals in clear and prioritized way, but B, express the time sensitivity or bounds associated. Because sometimes we ask for things and we don't necessarily clarify, I need it in 24 hours, in a week, in six months, in 12 months. So the more that we can be explicit in the time constraints and operational impact of our demand signal, the better that CTOs across the man training and equipping organizations and the war fighting organizations can coexist. Yep. And we talk a lot about the speed of relevance and the speed of technology. The speed of trust is right at the center of all of that. In that particular case, the sky distilled a message very clearly. I think it was going through. Gentle roasting is the technical uh, term. Is that right? Effective and repeated until complete, right? And so we got that escalated as a result of that. I think we had more of the right people on and then we got player coaches involved. Sky, I have to ask you, how has what's been happening in Israel and Gaza and the Palestinian territories changed the nature of your job? It's been very interesting because I had a year of quote unquote peacetime, as peaceful as CENTCOM ever is, a year to get my footing to start mechanisms and then we rolled into the world post October 7th and they are fundamentally different. I think that the most important adjustment for me was adjustment of prioritization of when and how I step in and push. Because when we were at a more steady state, it was very reasonable and necessary for me to step in and push innovation mechanisms and technologies and exercises and all of these activities that the command had the space and room to run. Once we moved into more of a crisis mode, it was necessary to be very precise and say, there is no question that we will continue our innovation efforts. It has to. This is not a nice to, this is not a nice to have. This is a need to have. 
those efforts have to be catered to the existing crisis. We have to be mindful of the realities of the time that is being taken by the entirety of the staff. I have to say it is absolutely incredible what the command does. Separate from me, I am not a warfighter. I am not somebody who executes on so many of the missions that have had to be done in the last 12 months. It is incredible to me to be on the outside and watch what a command performing at the highest level of performance in one of the most complex set of crises can do. So for me, it is important for me to move from asking all of those questions that I did in the first year to carefully listening and contextualizing and inserting myself where appropriate, where I could see that the ball would be moved forward for the priorities that had been readjusted as the crisis moved forward. So a very different way of interacting, but hopefully a same outcome of the command is receiving capabilities that the users need at a faster speed than they would otherwise to execute their missions, but being much more targeted and precise than it might have been in a more generic circumstance. It's a great answer. I could tell by that that just very thoughtfully thinking about how you balance the urgent and important with the non-urgent and important with limited resources. And also probably, I'm not asking you to comment on this, but also the time and attention that you can get from your boss now, especially in, on certain parts of the news cycle. Not that it's news cycle driven, but event driven rather. Credit where credit is due. The guidance I think that I have received that the entire command has received is that innovation is not a nice to have, it's a need to have. And if anything, crisis actually drives innovation more because you have to be creative. Innovation at its core is creative problem solving. I think sometimes we overinflate it with technology. The way that the commander frames it is innovation is about people, it's about processes, and oh, by the way, it's about technology. Sometimes technology is involved, but for the problems that we were seeing, there was no greater need for innovative thinking and for creative problem solving. And so I think that the emphasis on it did not change. It was just there was a much more precise application. Back on the man, train, and equip side, the force generation side, Justin, how have the wars in Ukraine, obviously the aftermath of October 7th, and fears about Taiwan contingency changed the way your part of the Department of the Navy has been operating? We should all be learning all of the time, right? And so the quote is, the nature of war doesn't change, but the character does, and it's not linear. And so this is one of those times that I think we're learning more. I see that across the organizations that's happening. One of the things that we've tried to do to improve that and codify that and reduce the overhead in comms. So to make it easier to connect dots is we're focused on outcomes and time horizons. And so the urgency has come to Sky's point. We were moving fast before, and then now this is different. How we apply that is we are all the balance is we all have to live in multiple horizons at once. And so we've broken this into horizon one is operational living. Horizon two is where are we experimenting, where are we innovating, and where can that shove into and make an impact from an outcome perspective in horizon one? And then how are we communicating with our private sector partners to bring the best things forward. And so like the S&T community, our relationships with venture capital, our relationships with internal research and development have really upticked. And so if we're all focused on operations and we're not also communicating with them, there's potential for that to get out of balance. And so we're now living in those three horizons at once and the driving forces there are outcomes. Can you prove that you're better? And so when we talk to partners or vendors, everyone thinks they're awesome, right? When someone's selling to the government, but how much difference can you make right now? Show us in terms of mission outcomes, not in terms of the technology. Hey, just to take a quick break from my conversation with Justin and Skylar, I'd like to tell you about Crossing the Valley, a new podcast that tells the stories of the companies that have made the transition from pilot to production in the defense market. It goes deep on how they cross the notorious valley of death. So whether you're an entrepreneur, investor, or government customer, you maybe can do the same. Check out valleycrossers.com or wherever you get your podcasts. The second season just started and Noah Scheinbaum, the host and creator, is really good at this. And if you like to hear more about what CENTCOM is doing in the technology area, you might already listen to the Building the Base podcast. You should be anyway. If you like War on the Rocks, you'll like that one too. CENTCOM had a partnership with Building the Base. They did four great episodes in April that you should listen to if you want to hear more on this. Anyway, back to my conversation with Justin and Sky. 
by the time this episode comes out, our listeners will have heard my back and forth with Secretary Frank Kendall, who was gracious enough to have me over to the Pentagon for an episode about the struggles of new entrants in the defense tech space. This is something that you two have a lot of touch points on. And you mentioned venture capital. One thing I'd love to get your views on, I've found through personal experience and just talking with other people I've gotten to know who run defense tech companies that there seems to be a lot of uncertainty about when, whether, and how people in government, in the services, or in other parts of the department are allowed to talk to VCs, are allowed to talk to venture capital. There's some people who feel like they're never allowed to talk to venture capital, and they absolutely will refuse to do it. And there's other people who feel like they don't even need to think about it, they just do it. What's your sort of guiding principle on when, whether, and how you will talk to venture capital about specific areas of technology? Our focus tends to be more on consistency of talking to everybody. Our preference would be to talk to more people so that they understand the problem set better rather than to withdraw because we think that that's how you end up with an entire industry that is accidentally supplying you with technology that doesn't meet your need. So for us, a huge piece of that is getting people forward into theater. And to us, it is fine as long as we are making that a readily available opportunity. So for example, we run an event called the CENTCOM Innovation Community. We cycle people forward into theater for about a week, 10 days to show them what it's like, what it's like to sit at a base defense operations center, what it's like to be out on a ship, to be out in Bahrain with NASA sent with unmanned surface vessels to really feel what the problem is, because to us, the venture capital community in particular then has the ability to have an outsized voice in communicating that problem back. We don't have time, unfortunately, to talk to every single company, but venture capital individuals and companies are a really great way of broadcasting the message of what the problem that we are collectively trying to solve for is. Market research is everyone's job. We are trying to get smarter on what exists, and then also, as Sky said, share those problems earlier. So one thing that I think we've done differently is instead of one-on-one -on -one comms, where possible, we are broadcasting. We're putting out a clearer message on how we're thinking about these problems and where we have a specific problem, like what that is, so that they can bring it to us. There's more of them than there are of us in general. So if we can turn that into a funnel, when I joined the government, everyone would come in with their little canned pitches. And I would sit there and I would you know, eat my turkey sandwich and listen and say, okay, we can never buy them because they don't understand what we have. Now we're saying, hey, fill out a lean business case and tell us how you're going to either divest something or change the game into some more specific area. That's more work on those companies and those venture capitalists, but it also means that we can have two meetings instead of seven meetings or four meetings instead of 14 meetings. We can't waste as much much time in the general eaches of those conversations. We need a clearer message. This is a place where the government is communicating more effectively. And I think our buying power will reflect that. For the engineers listening to this episode, whether they're everyone from mechanical to electrical to computer and beyond to quantum to technologists listening, explain to them why you think they should come in and work for DOD rather than stay in private industry. And is it a binary choice? So I teach grad school. And for the longest time, I'd have these super talented folks, and then I'd do one day on government and say, like, hey, who wants to work for government? And you'd hear the normal reasons why they didn't want to do it. This generation, what I've seen, especially the ones coming out of school, are they want to be a part of something bigger. The service piece is a bigger deal to them. And so there are more mechanisms for that. And I can tell you, I mean, the first thing that often comes up is money. I would take a pay cut to work with the people I'm working with and serve the people we're working. It is awesome. It feels awesome. And that is something that I think drives us all. In, uh, in terms of the later career folks, what we're seeing is more people who've made successful exits or millionaires are coming and saying, hey, how can I help? Why? You're trying to angle on the government? No, I just want to make a difference. I've accomplished some of what I wanted to accomplish professionally, the country needs this right now. And so one of the things that I realized when I was in my short time in uniform was, oh, you get a lot more responsibility when you have problems as big as the government, right? And so if you want big problems and hardworking people who are, you can find patriots who are in it for all the right reasons, and you want to tackle something that will make you better and this country better and the best customers, users, people that we're serving better. I mean, that's the number one reason. Anyway, one of the students, he went and he said, hey, I, I want a, the hardest problem possible. So he went to work at Twitter. And I said, why is Twitter hard? And he was like, the scale is hard. 
I'll call him back because I, I don't know if they've done a round of layoffs recently or not, but they go back and forth. He's like, a guy named Elon's about to take over and I can just tell it's going to be and I want to be there for the hard times. The idea is we have scale and challenge and impact. I don't know where uh, who else can beat that. Couldn't agree more. I mean, the impact in particular, if you are in commercial sector, if you if you are not in commercial sector, if you work in a completely different field, if you know a service member, somebody on your block that went to West Point, somebody that enlisted straight out of high school, a cousin, a family member, imagine that person forward at an operating base where they either have one way UAS coming at them or they are at threat from something else around them. You have the ability to contribute to something that would make them safer, that would make their jobs easier, that they would save them time so that they can get one more hour of sleep. That is why you contribute to this mission, because there are people in our country who serve and defend us, and we have an opportunity to serve them in turn, and technology is a huge way of doing that. And to this point, it's about outcomes. So people serving are people in uniform. That is the greatest sacrifice. There are civilians who are serving, right? I have folks who medically DQ'd out of the military, and they are given back really hard, sitting next to total nerds like me, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, and all of them, right? And then the folks in industry who- Don't be so hard on yourself, Justin. Uh, You're a former athlete. Who, uh, who just want to get it done, right? And so like anyone in this ecosystem who Who's contributing to mission outcomes to me is part of that service badge independent. But let's also talk about some of the hard parts. So I once upon a time was a civil servant. I uh, deal with civil servants now, especially with my other business. It, it can be grueling work and the bureaucracy can really drive you down. There are lots of people who are mission driven and dedicated and they're trying to do the right thing. And even when they're surrounded by other people who are just as mission driven as them trying to do the right thing, the system does not always make it easy and it will often make it hard. Even for senior people, which is something that I think people don't appreciate is that a lot of senior people are extremely constrained by the system too. How do you deal with that? And how do you advise people that work in your organizations to deal with the psychological toll that takes, which often drives people to leave government? I mean, my approach to it is that the complexity works in both directions, where the complexity of the bureaucracy can slow you down, but it also means that if you are finagly and wily enough, you can find a way through it. So if you will push on enough doors, if you will find enough connections across a network, somebody somewhere has faced a problem, something like what you are doing and is motivated enough to do it. So to Justin's point, we have a little bit of everything. We have a massive scope of problems that just ranges a little bit of everything. And we have mission. We have an incredible mission that people are willing to go to bat for. So if you're willing to beat your head against it long enough, or if you're willing to create a coalition of the willing and look for every single avenue, the complexity can work in your favor. That said, I think it's also important both individually and organizationally to create outlets for people to admit that this is hard. You cannot just sit here and pretend that it is normal to face a bureaucracy of this size. And so creating the space for people to vent productively and constructively to share their frustrations with one another. There are a lot of informal communities across the department of folks who work in technology space in particular, but beyond that as well, where you are able to at least vent some of the frustrations shared across the community, but then also more importantly, to highlight the people who are making progress. I think that it's easy sometimes to look as an individual out into the sea of bureaucracy and think, oh my gosh, am I making any difference at all? But the reality is that we are just a part of a baton pass. If we move the ball forward an inch, two inches, that is sufficient because somebody else will grab it after us. We are building on the progress that was made by somebody before us. So highlighting the people who have made good work, I stand on the shoulders of so many phenomenal individuals and organizations before me who paved the pathway for me to even have a role like CTO. Highlighting their work, I think, helps people remember that even if it doesn't feel like you're making forward progress, you are, and it's meaningful for people who come after you. To that point, the most frustrated I've ever been is when I didn't know what winning was. And so there are a lot of people and they don't see the full picture. And we know that JFK story about everyone was helping. Everyone at NASA was helping someone get onto the moon. If you don't know. It's right. The one where he saw the maintenance man. Or yeah, the, uh, yeah. 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 Uh, and and for, so, for those who haven't, he saw a maintenance man or someone's cleaning up in the hallway. And he said, uh, in NASA, JFK says, what do you do? He's like, well, we send people to the moon. And that, that even a maintenance man felt that way, felt, you know, is that everyone was vested in the mission. They were right? making sure. They, right? Yeah. They were making sure no one slipped. 
so the floors yeah. were dry so that uh, astronauts and engineers could do their job, right? And so what does winning look like in your role? And so like we've tried to be really explicit with here is what winning looks like. And so if you define that at a more granular level, then like we can get wins every day. In fact, we're getting wins and losses like micro wins and losses every day. And so there's always good and bad. I would say that two things about this. One, the kind of the best mental model, uh, sometimes the simplest. I was talking to Jen Polka who wrote Recoding America recently. Which Secretary Kendall, that's the one book he recommended when he was, uh, we're recording this, dear listener, before that episode is actually aired. They'll have listened by the time they hear us. But that's why you're confused, because obviously you listen to every episode (laughs) of the War on the Rocks podcast. So as uh, as Secretary Kendall said, I was talking to uh, Jen Polka recently, and she said, hey, there's go energy and there's stop energy in every organization, right? And so if you're looking at an organization as a system, is there a lack of go energy or a lack of stop energy or or where is that balance what you're saying is in some different periods of time in some organizations there's a lot more stop than go so where does the stop come from law regulation policy like bureaucrats for the sake of uh, bureaucracy there's the, no shortage of that people not knowing how to use the authorities available to them and so where does the go energy come from to sky's point uh, it comes from activated people who are connected to each other it comes from not a loophole but an opportunity seen it comes from being schrodinger's cat like i think all three of us are where we say hey if we see enough opportunities a connection is going to arise from this and so i also am not sure if i exist so that actually <laughs> yes fits. i relate to that more than i yeah. should <laughs> so we need to between we're gonna call this episode shorting or cto <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with the, with the, it, no, with the cat in you. parentheses. No, this is good. All right. So uh, you, you find your uh, your unleashed folks. You find your go energy, and we see if we can fan the flame. And then if we can connect them to a tribe, the long, short answer of this is if you have people who would go to bat with you and you're in there, even if you're on a hard fight and you haven't gotten there and you get there, like that's part of winning. And then maybe we're trying for touchdowns and not just first downs, right? If we can shoot the hole and score big, that lasts a little bit longer. I think that's a really fair point. At the end of the day, we're not going to win through the big, sexy wins. We can't, you know, it's sort of almost like this book I love that people have heard me talk about ad nauseum, The Allure of Battle by Cathal Nolan, where he basically attacks the notion that wars are won by these big, glorious battles. They're actually won by staying in the fight, by good logistics, by financial endurance by maintaining public support by these things that are seen as not sexy but require constant tending maintenance gardening almost so it's more infinite game than finite game especially with that someone told me the other day so this guy and i recently won an award and they're like oh that was great no that is like in the background stuff right what winning looks like is you have someone who's more equipped than they were yesterday and they're twice as equipped tomorrow like these are measurable things tell me a story each of you about something that's happened to you in this job or something you've, you've played a role in that you never would have guessed would have happened to you or that you would have seen when you took this job? Mine is that I did not expect the progress that we would have made with digital modernization as it relates to war fighting at our command in a positive way. Again, to the previous points, I think it's important to highlight the progress that's being made, acknowledging that there is a long road ahead of us and that there's a lot of work to be done. But the progress that we have made building out digital interfaces that allow us to conduct all of our functions better, targeting, planning, logistics, intelligence, everything. I thought it would take longer and I underestimated the creativity and drive of the members of the command if you just gave them the right tools. I think that we thought that there would be a build that was required from the outside, a push that was required from the outside. So a perfect example of this is that we have a recurring digital warfighting series called Digital Falcon Oasis. It's every 90 days we run a sprint that is pushing these different tools and applications. Uh, Can I just say I saw on LinkedIn the AI generated image that you made for that of like the giant panels of the desert being lifted by digital waves and... Is that what it's really like? <laughs> that Yes. Okay. It, oddly, that actually was not generated by AI. No? That was just a oh. picture that I took outside my window at CENTCOM. <laughs> this is how it goes at CENTCOM. Professional grade photography. In addition to the springboard. Yeah. The only thing I'm in trouble for is bringing a camera into headquarters. But other than that, everything was real. But the series itself, I think, started with us pushing from behind, where we were getting momentum and we were saying, 
swear, there are tools that can make your jobs easier. There are reasons that we are investing in this series. And then over time, and especially after October 7th, we found ourselves chasing the users where they were going direct to the engineers, which was perfect. That was exactly what we needed them to do because they knew the art of the possible. They knew how to communicate the demand signal. They knew what to expect when they interacted with those engineers. And they would put out those requests and churn and move forward at a rate that was faster than what we did in the first year. That is where we are now. At this point, we are hands off for the most part. My team is hands off for that type of exercise. Our J3, our joint directorate for operations, runs that exercise series and executes it with little to no touch from us. We do management around the edges when there are engineering priorities that may not be front and center that need to continue to move forward, but the users sprinted past us. And I don't know that we anticipated that a year ago. And that's the real win is when things like that happen through the normal, traditional, quote unquote, parts of the organization. Absolutely. Similarly, I think there's some things that we threw up there. We didn't know if they'd sink or swim and how much they've resonated has really shocked me. So about 15 months ago, a guy on our team, Mike Day said, Hey, I want to do some piloting in a pretty structured way. And I said, how many pilots do you want to do? He said, we did one last year. I want to do three this year. I said, well, we have a lot of things that we want to get much better. Like, how do we prioritize? And he was like, well, we're just going to get a team of player coaches and, and get after it. And so we opened up the aperture. And I said to industry at large, if you have something that's a game changer, we're going to rack and stack based on outcomes. I thought we'd get 20 applicants. We got 150 applicants. Dang it. We can't do 150. So we racked and stacked. And then we told other people cost sharing, we were able to fund 20. And I thought, oh, there's no way that we can fund 20 different pilots, each pilot, so that we had a constraint. And we said, okay, each pilot needs an operator to make sure this is valid going all the way through, who can trace it to a requirement and a real life thing. We need the pilot lead, who is the gunner and making it happen. And then we need the transition target because we could have the best thing ever. But if it's not going into a portfolio on the back end, if there's not someone pulling it, it's dead. And so we got three times 20 of those. And so we ran 20 the year after we ran one and we broke them into themes. And so for the fix my computers theme or the automation theme, we saw 87% improvement on latency and throughput on the installation of the future activity. We ran passive optical networking, wireless, and some new fiber things that ended up turning into something that we were doing in Guam. People kept coming out of the woodwork. It was more like people are eating fish and bread and then just people are coming out and gravitating. Special ops said, hey, we can help with that. We have a really similar problem. Can you send us your mobility strategy? We want to join in. So the amount of resonance across different commands, portfolios, that allowed us to rip through that list. We got through the 20 of the 150. We killed some because they were not going to transition. The other ones, the outsized impact, we're looking to scale those to hundreds of thousands of people. And in one case, a million people. There's some real power in, in sharing sharing problems from across the enterprise and giving everyone sort of visibility on those and then collaborating on those solutions. What is a book that you find yourself, aside from the one that we just discussed a few minutes ago, a book on technology that each of you find yourselves recommending to people? For me, I tend to steer clear of technology-specific books because I think that they really quickly become overcome by events, just given the speed of update. I do like historical books that reflect on technology evolution over time and where we might be able to learn from that. So an example of that is a book called Engineers of Victory. The author is Paul Kennedy. It goes over the engineering teams that were working on various technologies for World War II. And it describes some of the successes, it describes some of the failures, and it helps crystallize for me some of the problems that happen when you don't integrate the user early enough into your technology integration process. There are realities and frictions of practical deployment that you cannot imagine until you put it out in the theater in the hands of a user. If you make the perfect piece of technology, but it takes the user three months to train on it and they're only forward for six, that might not be the best option. If you build a piece of technology that works perfectly on a flat open space, but if you happen to be next to a mountain, it doesn't work, that might be a problem. If there are, you have a piece of technology that works perfectly in the winter, but immediately breaks in the summer, that might be a problem. So books like Engineers of Victory helped crystallize for me the importance of integrating the user early and often into technology development and integration, because without it, you risk rolling out things that have no utility to anybody. The technology book 
other than the Secretary Kendall from last episode, uh, uh, that, that I read most recently that I liked was probably A Thousand Brains. It's like a precursor to some of the artificial intelligence things that are happening. I like to read a lot. And so one thing I do is I, I try and read like three different books at the same time to just see if they connect or like where to bounce them off. And so recently when reading A Thousand Brains and Super Communicators by Duhigg, like it made me realize like, oh, here is some of what like from a science and then uh, potentially like technology applied looks like. And then here's why we're not able to, to Sky's point, like adopt this quicker. Like where does that fit? Like there's some crossing the chasm kind of inputs there. So I, I think both of those, but kind of the intersection of the two, it creates like its own entity. So maybe it'd be weird and read both of those at the same time. I actually really admire people who do that, who read three books at the same time, because what I like to do is read three books at the same time to ensure that I don't finish either of them. Any of them is not what happens in reality. Well, this has been a great episode. Thank you both for coming on the show. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the War on the Rocks podcast. Don't forget to check out the War on the Rocks membership program, War on the Rocks Platinum. You get access to all these podcasts, newsletters, an app, a discussion forum, more all the time. It's a great community. Join the core of our tribe. Become a member at warontherocks.com slash membership. In the meantime, stay safe and stay healthy. And thanks for listening. Thank you.